So today we're exploring the power of understanding, and I thought it would be fun to look at the SAT answers of some 16-year-olds in 2002 to kick us off. Name the four seasons was one of the questions. Salt, pepper, mustard, and vinegar was the answer. <laughs> What's the meaning of the term cesarean section? It's a district in Rome. <laughs> What's the fibula? A small lie. <laughs> How do you keep the milk from souring? Leave it in the cow. <laughs> it's actually a good answer. <laughs> and finally, what is a terminal illness? It's when you get sick at the airport. I like a lot of their answers better than the reality, don't you? <laughs> so we all know that understanding, it's a lifelong process, right? We're always learning, we're always gaining more. But this kind of thing, you know, information, this kind of intellectual understanding isn't really the understanding we're after. I mean, it's a part of it, but it's only one part of the power of understanding, the spiritual power of understanding. So we've been on this journey through faith and strength and love and wisdom and the power of power and imagination last week. And now we land at understanding, the ability to comprehend. But it's so much more than that. It's the ability to not only take in and comprehend, but it's to fully digest, to assimilate our understandings, to realize, to have an aha or an insight, which is a big part of our spiritual journey, is the touching in of this power. The power of understanding is symbolized by the color gold because, let's face it, understanding is golden, right? When we get it, it's like, yes, <laughs> it's a golden gift, right? So we can remember the colors reflected in that way. And the disciple, you might guess, is Thomas, known as the Doubting Thomas, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about Thomas a little bit later. There's also a, a female figure for each of these from the Bible, and this week's is Mary of Bethany, who represents understanding. Many scholars think Mary of Bethany is actually one and the same with Mary Magdalene. There's so many Marys, it's kind of hard to sort it all out. But, um, but the, the reason why she's chosen for the power of understanding is because remember Mary was the one who chose to sit at the teacher's feet to receive the teachings rather than to scurry around getting the house ready like her sister Martha was. And so Jesus had said she chose the better part. She chose the, the quest for understanding over the busyness and the distraction. And so Mary Magdalene also, if she happens to be the same Mary, um, so we'll just go with that. I think she was actually probably one and the same. But Mary Magdalene also represents the power of power that we talked about a few weeks ago. And she's unusual in that she's got a title, Magdalene, meaning tower. And you think about when we often say information is power. So information is power, but not really. I mean, really, information is neutral. It's the understanding of the information that is power, right? The understanding and the, and the action that we place on that, that's, that's where the power is. So the information, the intellectual part, is really kind of a neutral piece here. We're, we're looking for the deeper, the standing under um, piece of this when we're talking about the power of understanding. So located in the body, it is in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, but also the feet. The, the, the idea of standing under, literally, that understanding stands underneath us at the soles of our feet. So we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important that there are these two locations of the power of understanding. So it starts, understanding really starts to open up when we have a desire, right? When there's a desire of our heart that we really want to know something, we really want to, to have a, a comprehension of something in some way. And, and so Mary's desire to know is clear in this story. It's a desire to open up to more of the spiritual teachings. I don't know about you, but I, I, when I think about some really profound times in my life, life-changing times, they start with that seed of desire, that call, or that sense of almost urgency within us. Do you ever have that? There's like, there's, it's kind of a spiritual urgency, but we don't, can't really see the whole picture. 
but there's a sense of a pull towards something or we're being called into something somehow. We're not sure yet what it looks like or what to do with it. I remember clearly there was a major thunderstorm going on. I was at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I was auditing a class there by a professor who worked with me in my job back in Chicago. He was one of our consultants. And he was kind of luring me into the program that he taught, wanting me to study with him. So I came to check out the class. And I remember sitting, we couldn't drive because the, after the class, the thunderstorm was so heavy. I mean, we don't get thunderstorms like that in California so much, but if you've been in a, mid, a Midwestern, a really good thunderstorm, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when we say it's raining cats and dogs, we're not kidding, you know? <laughs> so we could not drive, the visibility was, you know, and so it's just, this rain is just diluging the car. And I'm sitting in the car with my former partner, Don, and I just start crying. I mean, there's the rain outside and my tears flowing. And I just said, you know, I feel like God is calling me. And I had just been in unity for a short, fairly short time. And I said, I just, I don't, it's like calling me to serve in some other way, but I just don't know what it is. And it's like that, that painful place of like, I know there's something big here, but I can't see it fully. As a friend of mine said, we often pray for guidance, but what we're demanding is revelation. You know? And we don't always get the big picture. So I was on that precipice of like, there's something, I feel it, but I can't like fully see it or know what it is. And so there was just this, this, this process of there's something here. And so I had to just be in the question because there was no answer available to me. It was just a pull, a knowing that there was a feeling, a strong feeling. So there, that desire was the beginning of the dawning of the understanding, but then it was the living into the question. So it's important that I think on our journey, on our spiritual journey, if we're earnest about wanting to evolve further, which I hope every single one of us is, and that we're, that we're on that journey of opening that understanding and insight into realization, that we formulate what it is that we're holding. What is that question I'm living? What is the question I'm walking with, I'm breathing every day? You know, and it'll change from time to time. Sometimes it'll be something small or it'll be immediate. Like I'm about to give a presentation and so I'm asking, what does the, the room need? What do the people need who are gathering? Or I'm about to write something and I'm asking what that message is. But it also might be bigger than that, like big life shifting kinds of things that we're holding or painful things or difficult things where we have conflict or trouble or concern. Whatever it is then to have that question, to be holding and living that question activates this power of understanding because you're giving over and over again to spirit, the spirit of your being and the allness of the source. You're giving that question. You're saying, this is what I want to know. How can I achieve greater harmony? What is the secret to opening up my joy? What is mine to do next? What is mine to, how should I show up with my boss or my spouse or my child in this situation where there's conflict or trouble or disharmony or discord of some kind? And so to then live that. And so in my case, the, you know, it was this, this kind of call, this pull, this feeling, and this uncertainty of what that was. And so just kind of holding it with an open hand. You know, I give it back over to you, God. Show me the way, you know, give me some light, some understanding. And I got a dream. And in that dream, that power of imagination that's closely associated in, in location and style to the understanding, that place of dreams and visions got activated. And in this dream, Dr. Robert Stake, this teacher that I had started to study with, died. And so I woke up worried about Bob Stake. So I called him. He's okay. And I thought, well, what is this about? And then I realized it was that possible fork in the road that I could have taken, that new path, that pathway that was opening to me that really wasn't mine to take. And it died. It fell away. That doorway closed. That doorway closed as I understood. I had the realization of what that dream was bringing me. And so then I knew there was another pathway that was beginning to open up more and more. And I had this seed of an idea, this little germ of an idea that would float in every so often. Wouldn't it be cool to be a spiritual teacher? 
And then it would just sort of float away and I would go off to do my regular work, you know? But it just sort of floated around there, you know? So it's like that divine idea comes in every so often, right? And we just kind of, we may really take hold of it at the right time, but there may be a, a seeding period of time where we just, we're kind of watering it with that holding the question, living the question, breathing the question, wondering, what's next? What's mine? What's here? What's now? Show me. Open my mind. Open my heart. So it is with the curiosity that we, the questioning, that really we open up this power. One of the, the three most powerful words to live is, tell me more. You know, without judgment and assumption and boxes and categories, especially when somebody's coming from a different direction or a different opinion, tell me more. It allows us to sit back, to listen, to open up, to receive a realization and an aha, to have an understanding from the heart, a connection from the heart, maybe even compassion. All of these things become available to us. When we are angry, we can ask ourselves, huh, curious, what is this anger? Tell me more, anger. Where are you coming from? What is your origin point? And we might get both where the sensation arises initially in our bodies, and we might also get an answer about where it comes from, like what thought is it connected to or memory is it connected to? What's the hot button that's getting pushed there? That may have nothing to do with really what's going on in reality that seemed to have triggered the anger. So to carry that question or those, that statement within us and in our relationships, tell me more, is an offering. It's, a, it's an invitation for understanding to dawn on us in a whole new way. It's, a, it's an invitation for understanding to be activated fully, not just here in the brain, but in the heart and in the body, in the standing under place. So that's the kind of work that we, we almost invite understanding in by our curiosity and our questioning, by our desire that it begins with, and then also with our openness. Remember in Matthew 7, it says, ask and ye shall receive, right? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And so there's a constant, you know, motivation for us or encouragement for us to be proactive in our spirituality. Ask, just ask what it is that you want. Seek, go out and seek it. Knock and the door will be opened. And there's another scripture that's like it, but it's on the other side where it says, here I am, spirit speaking, here I am knocking at the door. Who will hear my voice and open the door? I will come in and eat with you and you with me. So while we are seeking, whatever it is we are seeking, that love, that harmony, that financial freedom, whatever it is that we are seeking, the answers, it too is seeking us. That longing that we have is also that, that thing that we're longing for or that idea that we're longing for is seeking us as well. There's a knocking from the inside of the heart and the outside of the heart happening at the same time. It's like a call and response. <laughs> and when the call and response lines up, everything begins to open. It's the aha, the dawning. You know? I love to think about, as we did in the meditation experience, the idea that Right now, in this very moment in time, this captured moment in time, there is a dawning of understanding, a ripple all around the world. That right now we can imagine that there are people in the East and in South America and in Africa that are having an aha moment. <laughs> that there is a breakthrough in consciousness, that there is a new understanding, a realization, an insight. It's happening all the time. And there is really no, ultimately, in spirit, time or space. And so we are one with that kind of dawning of the light of greater amounts of spirit being spilled out onto the earth, known to all of us, accessible to all of us. So as we do our individual work, 
to remain in that following the desire and the curiosity and living the question, opening our minds and our hearts and our bodies to receive, then we are doing our work to bring that light and that dawning and that realization to the entire planet, to all of humanity. We think we're just doing some little thing for ourselves. No, not ever. <laughs> not ever. Don't ever think that following your spiritual journey is a selfish act. <laughs> You will get great benefit from it. You will be blessed and multiplied many times over, but so too will the whole world. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? If you say yes to your call, if you step into the light and you follow the light that is cast upon your path and you follow the core of wisdom in your being and the understanding that has dawned and you say yes to spirit and yes to spirit and you open that door and you invite spirit in and you let spirit commune with you and you with it, oh, what we can create in this world. That critical mass, that shift into full-on harmony, into full-on peace, into full-on love, all that we visioned last week together in the power of imagination, it can be so because we have activated the power of understanding, because we have opened to receive the answers from within and everywhere present, from each other even. So as we say, tell me more, we open to the possibilities of expansion for all of us. Ask, and then we will find the relief, you know. Ask about where that anger or sadness is coming from, and we'll find the relief. And seek, and we'll get the insights. And knock, and everything. All the doors to spirit will be blown wide open. All the doors to the truth of who we are. So there's a story from Zen about really opening and expanding ourselves in Zen Buddhism, where this, one of the teacher or the students comes to the master teacher and says, you know, I'm so constricted and I just feel so limited in my life. I mean, basically feel really unhappy, you know, and the, and the teacher says, oh, here, you know, and puts a, a pinch of salt and a glass of water and hands it over to the student. And the student thinks I have nothing to lose, so... Oh, that's so bitter, says the student. And the teacher says, oh, here. Brings the student over to the stream and puts that, it's about the same amount of salt, just a pinch of salt into the stream. It says, have a drink. And the student reaches down and takes a drink and says, all I can taste is fresh stream water. <laughs> Why is that? If our container is so tight, is so small, is so full of the minutia of the world and the focus of only what's in front of us and there's no room for expansion, well, then that's what we're going to get, right? But if instead we can open ourselves to the possibilities that are endless, the potential that is endless, then we will continue to drink of the stream of spirit, the stream of life, the living waters, isn't that what we want to taste? <laughs> no longer bitter. How can it be? Because we're not focused in that way. We're expansive. The little bits of bitter, the little bits of salt, well, we all get that. That's part of life. But we don't have to pay attention to it. We don't have to focus on it. We don't have to make it our existence. Wherever it is that we constrain ourselves or we constrict ourselves and constrict our minds and think, this is it. This physical existence is it. These things I have to do today are it. That's not living spirit, right? I've done this exercise before from Abraham Hicks where you put your to-do list on one side your, the things that you feel like you need to do today, and on the other side, you put what you're giving over to the universe. I tell you what, that is the most freeing exercise. I'm just remembering it in this moment. I'm going to do it this week. <laughs> because it just opens up the stream, right? Because it, it says, I am in partnership with spirit. It says, I am a spiritual being. And the things that I think are mine to do that burden me, don't need to burden me because they are opportunities and gifts and that is the dawning of understanding, of spiritual understanding, that we're in this together with each other, but most of all with the, most, the, the biggest partner of all, with the spirit, the truth that we have to work with. 
So as we open to these knowings, then we expand our hearts and we also and expand our minds. You know, the heart, the understanding heart is a part of it too. When we say to somebody, thank you for understanding, what are we really saying? We're really speaking to their heart, right? Thank you for having the compassion to understand where I'm coming from, to open your heart to listen to me. My prayer partner, Darlene, said that she came out of the grocery store one day. She had a, the cart full of groceries, and she had a bunch of things to do, and she was really focused, and she's, you know, going to lift up her trunk and put the groceries in. She notices the person next to her has parked over the lines so close to her that there's no way she's going to be able to open her door. And so she's feeling more and more irritated by the moment because she looks over, and it's a young girl, and she's just staring at her cell phone and texting, and she's thinking, oh, how oblivious. I mean, I can't even believe she parked over the line. I got places to go. This is really, and she's not even, you know, she's making noise. She's putting her groceries in. Girl's not looking. So finally she goes over and she knocks on the window and she says, you park so close, I can't even get in my car. And the young girl says, oh, I'm so sorry. She goes, I just, I came here to get my grandmother's medicine and they don't have it. And I'm really worried. And I'm trying to text my family and get information about where else I might be able to get her medicine because she really needs it. This is one of those moments, right, where we feel <laughs> suddenly very small. <laughs> but what is that when we say that? It's the ego, right? It's the ego beginning to fall away and to shrink and the understanding heart being present. And so, of course, Darlene was like, I, you know, I'm really sorry about that. You know, I know it's going to work out for you. And the girl, of course, moved her car. But as Darlene was walking away, the girl says, thank you so much for understanding yeah. So it is the assumptions, right, that we move through the world with that it's time to let go because they get in the way of understanding. When I see people acting up on the road, I just, I just automatically make assumptions. In fact, uh, in a positive way, Brenly and I will do this, like somebody cuts us off or rides the bumper. You know, anybody ever has these experience, curses you, you know, whatever it is that they do. And, and so just to think, you know, I don't know. We don't know what happened to that person, you know? Did their best friend just die? <laughs> Is their boss being mean to them, you know? Did they just get kicked out of their home and they can't afford the rent? Actually, probably likely for a, for a lot of people's real issues in the Bay Area. So it's like when you reframe, I don't know what happened to that person, but open up to an understanding heart, then it's like, what, you know, what are we going to do? you know, ride their bumper too because they rode ours, you know? It's just like that whole ego game. It's just like, don't waste our time there. We've got this precious gift of life, this precious power of understanding. And when we understand with our hearts and with our minds and with our whole bodies, oh, what we can do. And the body is important because it's the incorporation piece, quite literally, the corp meaning the body. The incorporation is when we get the aha, the realization, the insight, is to allow it to be embodied. Because then we walk the questions that we have and the, we walk the new realization that we have into life. It's that fifth principle of unity, putting it into action, walking the talk. So allowing it to just sort of distill into the cells. We can do that through, in a literal way through ceremony, but we can also just take your everyday mundane tasks and, and infuse sacredness into them. You know, allow yourself to take in that new insight in a new way. So if there was a dawning, well, maybe you go out at dawn and you have like a, a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you for that that wonderful insight that has dawned on me as this new day begins, I am a new person. And I'm, I'm now moving with this insight. I feel it. I feel it in the warmth that I feel from the sun in my face. You know? So there's a let your body participate because the body wants to participate. And the more it participates, the more we embody our understandings, the more we can do with them on the earth as a divine human being. That's why Charles Fillmore was smart to also call understanding something that stands under us, literally at the soles of our feet, not just at the prefrontal cortex of our brains, but also right beneath our feet so that we stand on that understanding, we move with that understanding. Years ago, I did a painting from the source workshop that 
where you, you just paint whatever's in your soul on these papers and you let the papers grow, you tape new papers, make it a bigger painting if you want. And over the course of the day, layers and layers of paint may go on and forms and shapes and different things may arise. And it's all this kind of just spiritual experience of outpicturing on the paper what is going on inside. And at the end of the day, the teacher did the most brilliant thing because we could have walked away there and gotten a lot out of it. It would have been using a lot of the power of, of imagination. But then she moved it to this embodied understanding and she said, okay, now what I want you each to do is to stand in front of your painting while the rest of us witness you and embody your painting. And it was the most profound experience both to witness and to embody your own painting. I mean, some people screamed like a primal scream, you know? And some people moved and danced, and it was a kind of a delightful and joyful kind of experience. And everybody was just in a different place with what it is that they were expressing. But it wasn't until we got our bodies into it fully that we could walk away then with the insights of the day, with the ahas of the day. So whatever that is for you, you know, like I like to swim laps and that's a meditation for me. So I'll just be thinking about things that are going on in my life and I'm just swimming and swimming and swimming and letting that go and then coming to spirit and coming to breath and coming to the rhythm in the water. So I don't know what it is for you that really gets your body into your spiritual experience, but whatever it is, I encourage you to do it. You know, just sit on the earth if it is or behold the flower. It doesn't have to be really physical but let your senses be a part. That's what Doubting Thomas taught us. Doubting Thomas taught us that he had to have a firsthand experience, a sensual experience. So we kind of dismiss Thomas and say, oh, you know, he didn't believe without seeing. Well, all his friends got to see when Jesus showed up in, in the resurrected body. And then they told Thomas about it and he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I can put my hand in the wounds where his, the nails were, or I can touch that place in his side where that, that wound was from the spear. But what Thomas was teaching us is that understanding needs to be embodied. It's a sensual thing too. And that I, when I touch it, when I see it, when I experience it firsthand, when I feel it in my body, then I'll really get it. And so it is all these aspects of being mind and heart and body that bring understanding into our beings. So this week, I just really want to encourage you to tap the desires of your heart and to find the questions that you're, that you're living, that you're breathing. Live and breathe those in spirit. And then let the realizations come and allow them to be really known in your mind, in your heart, in your whole body. Let's affirm together what the spiritual understanding is about in all these different aspects. Together, spiritual understanding dawns in my curious mind, opens my heart, and stands under my entire being. And so it is.